Uh, good morning. I wanted to um, speak to you today from the book of Ezekiel. Um, it's um, perhaps a book that um, maybe people are less familiar with than other books. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go through um, some of the historical setting of, of, um, of Ezekiel, kind of put him in context, um, speak a little about his contemporaries, where he was when he wrote his his, uh, well, his prophecies were given and sort of the structure of the book. And then from there, follow into the kind of the heart of what I want to say. Um, so Ezekiel, if you uh, want to find it in your Bibles, um, I do it just by sort of turning about halfway through, generally end up on Isaiah and then keep going forward. Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Lamentations, Ezekiel. And you kind of, you're, you're in the right place. Um, now, um, just to put is Ezekiel in context, uh, I want to give a very pot, brief potted history of Israel up to this point. Um, now, starting at the end, then going back to the beginning, Ezekiel is prophesying during the days of pretty much the last kings of, of Judah. Um, um, so, um, if it, you'll obviously remember most of this, but just to, just to give the potted history. So God... Um, met with Abraham, um, revealed himself to Abraham, and he made various promises to Abraham uh, about being the father of many nations and about uh, his descendants inhabiting or uh, inhabiting the land of Canaan. Um, from Abraham, um, by promise, he obtained Isaac as a son, had Isaac as a son, and then uh, Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and Jacob himself had 12 sons, the best known of whom is probably Joseph, who was sold into slavery in Egypt, and then um, he eventually became number two to Pharaoh in the land. And when the famine uh, hit the land of Canaan, uh, um, the um, Joseph's brothers came down, discovered that Joseph was still alive. And eventually the whole of Jacob's family moved into Egypt. In Egypt, eventually, uh, we're told that the Pharaohs forgot about Joseph and all the good he'd done and became fearful of Israel, who had multiplied in numbers because God had blessed them, and so they enslaved um, the children of Israel. Now, after um, 400 years or so, uh, God uh, met with a man named Moses, and Moses, he used Moses to um, deliver the people of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt and bring them out of that land um, and bring them into the land of Canaan. Now, along the way, he um, uh, they stopped and God basically gave Moses what we call the old covenant. Um, God had had a covenant with, with Abraham, these promises that he'd made to him. And now um, God starts with Moses with a new covenant that is new to the people of Israel. Um, anyway, so they, they travel uh, through the wilderness very famously for 40 years and then eventually come to the river Jordan and then cross over Jordan um, and, um, attack the city of Jericho is their, their first con uh, conquest in the land. All of this will be kind of relevant to what I want to say. After um, Joshua, uh, we have the time of the judges where uh, God, Israel is kind of not ruled over by judges, but when there's a dispute or when there's an enemy comes to attack them, God raises up a man or a woman to uh, bring about the deliverance of Israel. For example, Gideon um, being a very famous example. Now, um, after the time of the judges, the people of Israel became, um, they kind of fell away a bit from, from the Lord, um, and they wanted a king. They wanted to be like the nations around them, didn't want to work in the way that God had set up for them. Um, so God appointed a king. That king was Saul. Now, Saul started okay, um, but again, turned away from the Lord. So God replaced him with David, uh, the great King David. And David um, himself was succeeded by Solomon. Now, um, Solomon, um, again, started well, but towards the end of his reign, things were not going so well. Um, and after him, his sons um, caused uh, almost civil war, I suppose, which resulted in the division of the kingdom of Israel into the northern kingdom, which remains named, uh, known as Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And those two kingdoms, um, although they had some sort of parallel experiences they, they went in in very different ways um in many ways um the northern kingdom of israel never had a king that honored <coughs> excuse me that honored god um followed the lord 
and they uh, started to practice idolatry. They brought in all the religious practices of the nations around them, many, many very evil things um, that they did. And the Lord um, sent many prophets to them, <coughs> um, but they didn't listen. And ultimately, the Lord brought in the nations around them to, to bring um, punishment on them, judgment on them, um, and they were carried away and they kind of disappear um, into history and, and nothing much is known about them. But the southern kingdom of Judah, it went on for a couple hundred years longer. And the kingdom of Judah had um, a mixture of kings. Some of them were, were great godly men who um, would uh, come in. They would cleanse out the land from all the false worship, cut down the, the, alt, the, the altars to false gods, remove the, the altars on high places, um, restore temple worship, um, um, be, be renewed in the word of God. And these things are great things throughout their history. Um, and one of those, which we'll come back to later, would be, would be Hezekiah, um, who is about four or five kings from the end. Um, but ultimately, uh, Judah, a couple of hundred years later, went pretty much the same way as Israel, the same practices, the same turning away from God, the prophets coming, God pleading and pleading and pleading with them, um, but not being listened to. And so we get to kind of the last days of the, the kingdom of Judah. Um, and what's happened in this time is that God has brought in uh, other nations as he did with Israel, and they have come and attacked uh, the people of Judah and have carried some of them away captive back to their own lands. And in this case, um, Babylon has come in, the kingdom of Babylon and his armies have come in. And Ezekiel has been amongst those people who have been carried out of the land, taken captive and taken back to, um, to Babylon. And at the beginning of uh, the book of Ezekiel, um, you'll find that Ezekiel describes uh, where he is. He's a, he's a priest, he's, um, but he's of Israel, but he's in the land of Babylon, um, having been carried away captive. Um, and so this is kind of the setting for this prophecy. So what we have in Ezekiel is a man who's raised up by God, who is given things by God to, sh to say and to show um, to the people of Israel in kind of the last or the people, so the people of Judah, if I say Israel, I really mean, I mean the southern kingdom of Judah, um, that he has brought, so he raised up Ezekiel um, in, in some ways to give them their last chance, but also in another way to pronounce almost the last, um, the last events that will happen to them before ultimately, um, effectively, um, after the last king of Israel, uh, Judah, Zedekiah, um, the kingdom of, of, of Judah pretty much comes to an end. Now, um, Ezekiel isn't the only prophet talking to Judah at the time. Um, Ezekiel is in Babylon and sort of contemporary with him at the same time as him. Uh, we have Jeremiah, um, who is in Judah. So what you have is um, two particular great prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and they are both talking to the same people, to Judah. They are pronouncing God's uh, judgments. They are um, speaking about what is going to happen to the nation. No one's listening to them. Um, um, but some, a, a few, a remnant, but not most. Um, but they're in different locations. You've got one from the perspective of the captivity and one from the perspective of kind of the, the awful things that are actually happening in Judah itself. Um, and so this kind of, it kind of gives us a, hopefully a sense of, of what Judah is, uh, sorry, Ezekiel is talking into. What, what, is God's, what is God speaking to? What is the condition of the nation when Ezekiel is speaking to them? Now, for the purposes of what I want to talk about this morning, um, I want to sort of roughly divide the book of Ezekiel into three parts. Chapter one to five, um, you have got this, uh, it starts with kind of knowing who Ezekiel is, where he is. Um, you've got great visions. He has um, heavenly visions. And then he has, um, um, he, he sort of does some acts out, some prophecies again about the siege of, of Jerusalem. Um, that's roughly, uh, very roughly chapters sort of one to five. Um, in chapters 6 to 39, we have the bulk of Ezekiel's prophecies about what is going to happen to Judah. Um, and uh, it's, it's that part and a particular aspect of that part that I want to speak about um, the majority of the time this morning. 
the last part of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48, um, is the tone changes quite dramatically. And again, Ezekiel is given um, these visions. And in, in these visions, he sees a new temple. He sees a new city. He sees a new priesthood and many other things. And he's, he's, it's, it's a totally new um, situation. Um, and it's nothing to do with what's going on in, um, in, in, in Judah. Now, the thing that caught my attention in chapters 6 to 39 is one particular phrase. And this phrase appears about 70 times in the Bible, um, I discovered, in various forms. Um, and 60 of those times are in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and this phrase is, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, other ver variants include things like then they shall know. So speaking, uh, some of these things speak about Judah, some speak about other peoples. Um, or maybe so you shall know that I am the Lord or I am the Lord God. Um, and it's this that, that really struck my attention, caught my attention, which is that throughout the book of Ezekiel, it appears that God is, is pleading with his people. He is, he is trying to show his people who he is. Um, he is time after time after time. Most of, most of these um, occurrences are about things that are going to happen to Israel and to the punishments. We'll come back to that in a minute. But this is, just seemed to me like God speaking to his people and saying, you need to know who I am. And I think more than that, he, he's saying, you have forgotten who I am. And these things are are to bring you back to the knowledge of your God. And there's something else that's really, I found really interesting about this, um, this, uh, this, this phrase, which Ron actually sort of almost alluded to, you've been listening to, to him carefully. Um, it's, it's the word, it, it says, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, um, this has been mentioned many times over the years, but you know if in the Old Testament you read, you read the word Lord and it's in capital letters, um, then it's not... Um, the normal word, Hebrew word for Lord. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the name of God. It's the name Jehovah. Um, and so when I read this and thought about this, I thought this isn't God said, this isn't God saying I am a Lord in, in, in um, one Corinthians, Paul writes and says, there are, there are many gods and, and many Lords. Um, so he's not, this is not sort of one Lord or one God amongst many. Um, this is um, the named God of Israel. And the name God of Israel has a history. Um, and I think what God is doing, it's, it's, it's every single one of these occurrences in, in Ezekiel. Um, I think what God is doing in, in it throughout the book of Ezekiel is he's saying, remember who I am. Um, because this name Jehovah has been associated with them, um, the name of their God, um, since the days of Moses. And there's an interesting uh, sort of aspect to how Israel came to know him by this name. I said in my introduction, the sort of the, the potted history of Israel, that God met with Abraham. Um, and God, he'd, he met with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Um, and interestingly, Jacob famously um, wrestled with, with uh, the angel of the Lord and asked him his name. And he wouldn't tell him his name. Um, and when God came to raise up Moses, and you read this in Exodus chapter 6, um, God says this to Moses, he says, I am Jehovah. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, or El Shaddai. Um, but my, by my name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them, my, um, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. So it appears that when... God met with Abraham. Abraham knew him as God Almighty, El Shaddai, and he, the covenant that God made with, with Abraham, um, in a sense, when, when Abraham thought of the name of El Shaddai, um, God Almighty, he would think, okay, these are all the things that God has promised me. These are the terms of the covenant that God has made with me that um, go with that name. Well, when it comes to Moses and God bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt, and much more than that, to establish with them a covenant to be their God, to for him to be them to be his people, for him to give them the land, um, 
for, to establish a, a, a priesthood and uh, all kind of manner, manner of worship, this, this completely new covenant that, that is, um, encompasses everything that Abraham had promised to him and yet has, has so much more to it, so much more revelation to it. Um, the Lord our God gives Israel a new name to know him by, not a new God, a new name that encompasses so much more that has so much more meaning attached to it that has so much more history to it or at least will have um, over the course of time and so when they think of the name of jehovah they are supposed to remember all the things that their god did to them who did for them um, in the same way that perhaps you know um, just thinking god almighty it's not got quite the same association um, so what did the name of Jehovah, as it were, mean to Israel right at the beginning? Well, Israel's God, Jehovah, would have been the one who delivered them out of Egypt. He's the one who gave them the promises. He, he's the one who did the signs and wonders, who took them through the Red Sea, who, who went before them as, as fire and, and, and cloud, who... Um, who fed them in the wilderness, who brought them into ultimately into the land of Canaan and gave them great victories and enabled them to subdue the land. So that's kind of, this, this is what, who Jehovah was. This is who, and if we're thinking just briefly back towards Ezekiel and all the things he's going to say to them, which we'll come to in a minute, um, you know, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. I am the God who, who brought you out of of Egypt, who gave you life, who set you free, who gave you the, the law and the, the promises and the covenant and um, the temple and everything else. I gave you all of this. Um, and it's also interesting, I think, to think about what the name Jehovah might have meant to the nations around Israel, because actually that is an important part of the story as well. When Israel came into the land of Canaan, as mentioned in the, the potted history. The first city they came to was Jericho. And um, Joshua, who was then leading the nation of Israel, um, sent spies out to go to Jericho and kind of find out what was, how, what was happening. And they come to the city and they find that the city is, is locked up, is barred, and, and kind of they, they get in and, and they meet with Rahab. And Rahab tells these spies that the people of Jericho are terrified. They're absolutely terrified of, of what's going to happen to them. And um, Rahab says to them that she's, they heard what, what Jehovah did to Egypt, what Jehovah did to the um, Red Sea, what he did to the kings who opposed the, the, the journey of Israel as they came out of um, Sinai and came towards Canaan. Um, they've heard, obviously, that they've crossed over the River Jordan. Um, and now this, this mighty army is encamped by their city and they are, they are terrified. So the name of Jehovah has become associated with this great and mighty God, this, this God who is not to be um, trifled with, not to be opposed. You know, he, he, he delivers his people. He gives them victory over king after king. Um, but very interestingly, and this is always the thing to kind of, you have to mention with, with, with Rahab is that, Yes, she, she's part of these people and she's afraid, but also she decides that she's going to call on the mercy of this God. She's going to see if this God will be merciful to her. And she discovers something else about Jehovah, that he is a God of mercy and grace to those who throw themselves on his mercy. And she comes to know something that perhaps the, the Israelites should have known, certainly ought to have known. But she knows something that maybe the rest of Jer Jericho has no knowledge of. Um, Later on, um, coming to Solomon's time, um, the Queen of Sheba decided to come and visit uh, Solomon to see if the stories that she'd heard about Israel and its God were true. Um, and she comes to Solomon and she, she questions him and she tests him and he, he passes every test. He answers every question. She sees the, the magnificent splendor of um, of Jerusalem and what God has done there, what God has established there, what Jehovah has done. And she says, blessed be Jehovah, your God who delighted in you. So she somehow recognizes also that this is a people that God delights in. Um, 
setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever um, and so on. So at, at this point in time, at the, uh, in the early days of the kingdom of, uh, of Israel, um, uh, irrespective of the way they've, they've gone back sometimes and the same times the judges were difficult, the name of Jehovah actually was meant to be a, a name associated with the God of Israel, who is a God of, of power and um, authority and righteousness and justice and who loves his people and prospers them. Um, a God who, who um, would draw other people to Israel to come and find out um, what their God was like and who this God is. Now, we haven't got time to go through all the bits in between. But by the time um, we come to Hezekiah, um, we know that the nations around Israel, around Israel, the northern kingdom, have already come and destroyed it and taken the people away. Many have died. Um, and the, the kingdom of the northern, northern uh, nation has just gone. Um, and we, we have this, this point in time where um, the king of Assyria comes and he comes against Israel. Um, and he comes down to Hezekiah and he says, who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver you? his people from my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand. That's Second Chronicles chapter 32, if you want to read it later. Um, so Sennacherib, he comes and he says, to, as far as he's concerned, the God of Israel is no different to the gods of anywhere else. Um, and he, will, he is certain that he will overthrow uh, Hezekiah because Hezekiah's God will be no more match for him than any other God has ever been. Um, and any other people have ever been. Now, God, uh, unfortunately for, for, for Sennacherib and the armies of uh, Assyria, um, they happened to come to Israel at the time of a king who worshipped God. And God, Hezekiah famously um, pleads with God, and he puts the letter he's received from the king before God and says, you know, they're, they're blaspheming your name. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I am weak. I can do nothing about it. But he just looks to God entirely for um, for deliverance. And God graciously delivers Israel from the hand of um, its enemies. And Hezekiah, um, Hezekiah's reign um, ends in peace. Unfortunately, after that, Hezekiah's sons and grandson, um, just it, that's really the point of decline where there's really no return. There's maybe one more good king on the way. Um, so we get to this time again, we're getting so closer and closer to, Hez to Ezekiel here. Um, there's there's one verse actually. It's in it's in Romans uh, chapter three um, that just I think summarizes the condition of Israel um, and Judah at the end of their time, the end of those kingdoms, and it just says this: "For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you." as it is written. Now, if you look in your Bibles in, in Romans chapter 3, that's verse 24, um, you'll quite often find, I think most, most modern translations, if it's a quotation from the Old Testament, um, the words are in italics just to highlight the fact that this is a, a quotation of, of Old Testament scripture. Now, in this case, um, I think in my Bible, it's in italics, but it's not a direct quotation. It's kind of a, a synthesis of a couple of ideas that, um, that you will find. Um, in fact, one of them uh, comes from Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 36, um, uh, God says to Ezekiel, he says, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, that is Jehovah, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, for which you have, profane, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. So God is saying all the things that I'm doing, I am doing to reestablish the, to reestablish my name, to reestablish the respect, the honor, the glory, so that people might know that I am the God of Israel, that you might know. That then all these things then you shall know that I am Jehovah to know, to know who I am um, but notice that bit where it says which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went so it seems that wherever the people of Israel went and the, 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 the sort of practices they, they carried out and the way they behaved um, and then they would worship their God Jehovah and people would see that and they would say well that's what, that's what Jehovah is like he's just like our gods they make the same kind of offerings the same kind of sacrifices um, He's no different, that the people are no more righteous, they're no different to us, that they're just like us. 
Um, and God says, actually, that means my name is being profaned, blasphemed. It's, you, you are sullying my name, the name that is supposed to be the, the great and mighty God, the, the wonderful, glorious God of heaven and earth. Um, that name is being trampled in the dirt um, because of the way my people behave. Um, the second part of uh, Romans, the sort of source where in the marginal notes my Bible gives for uh, Romans 3 is Isaiah 52, um, verse 5, where it says, Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing? Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord, and my name is continu blasphemed continually every day. So it seems that at the end of the life of the kingdom of Judah, um, every day, almost in everything they do, um, God's name is being dragged through the mud. He's being associated with great wickedness. And it is, it is a sad fact, I think, that um, the reputation of God in the world is really tied to his people. Um, and I say that's a sad fact because people only really see God through what they see in us. And people in that time only really saw who Jehovah was through how his people behave. So, quite a long introduction, but the point is this. I want to get to Ezekiel 6.36 and this, this phrase, um, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now you can split these phrases roughly, I have done into two broad categories, the inward looking and the outward looking. Uh, that is to say, those things where God is speaking about Israel and Judah and those things where he's speaking about um, uh, the, uh, and nations outside them. There's roughly two to one split. So the inward things God addresses twice as often as the outward things. Again, very broadly speaking. Um, and they can, they can, those things can be further divided into to punishments and promises. Um, and what I want to do briefly then is look at some of these, these punishments that God is meeting out, that he's carrying out on the people of Judah. Um, and remember that the point of all these things is that he is, he is trying to draw the, his, their attention to who he really is. Um, and I've got sort of five just aspects. But in those chapters, there's so many things. and There's no way there's time to go through them at all. And I shall only go through them briefly. Um, with the first one in chapter six, um, the first time this, this um, expression is used, um, it's a pretty gruesome chapter. Um, but it's all talking about idolatry um, and basically the act of substituting something for God that is not God, whether it's wood or stone or metal or whatever. It's bowing down and worshipping something that inherently is not God. It's letting your life be ruled by these things rather than God being Lord over you. Um, and kind of reminds us of Deuter Deuteronomy chapter five, where the Lord says, you shall have no other God before me. Um, in fact, he says, I am Jehovah. Um, put a name to it. Um, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no idols and so on. Uh, and make no images to set them up and worship them either. Um, as I say, e Ezekiel chapter six is, is quite gruesome. What he says is that the, the bodies of the people who worship idols will be, will, will lie, will lay slain by the enemies of Israel before the altars of their, God, their false gods. Um, it, is a, it is a picture of what will happen um, when the Lord returns, um, when God comes in his vengeance and anger. Um, but it's, it's a, a reminder to us that, that God wants us to know him and he wants to destroy all idolatry. Um, Another topic that's mentioned very often, um, at least in chapters 5, 8, 9, and 23, is this idea of the defiled sanctuary. This is not just people worshipping idols in their own home and having personal idols, but this is, this is the idols of the nations and the idols that Israel sets up being brought into the house of God, into the temple, and being worshipped in the place of God. And there's a, an interesting passage in Ezekiel chapter 10 where Ezekiel has one of his more sort of heavenly vision moments and he, he sees the glory of God departing from the temple. This is the last days. This is the end. This is God. This is God going. And he, he, 
he actually says at one point, you've driven me out. Um, um, and it's, it's uh, kind of, it's, it's one of those things where you, if you, you read and you think, Lord, you want the Lord to speak to you through these things and exercise our hearts. And my exhortation to you all is, is to go and read Ezekiel. Um, it's not short. It's quite a long book. And look at all these places where it says, then you shall know that I am the Lord. And just ask yourself continually through reading that book, Lord, that I might know you better, that I might know you, um, that you might deal with me so that I know you. Um, um, and just, as, just on this topic, the defiled sanctuary in Second Corinthians, we're reminded by Paul, you, corporately and individually, you are the temple of the living God. Um, and I think it's 1 John chapter 5. Um, where John says something like, um, little children, keep yourself from idols. Um, so these are, these are inward looking things. Um, Ezekiel chapter 11 has something interesting. I think it's maybe mentioned a couple more times, but, um, where God speaks to those who try to flee from the land of Israel. They try to flee to other nations away from what's happening. And God actually says, you'll be, you'll be caught at the borders and slain. And those who, who survive, um, will we'll we'll have to give a testimony to the nations you flee to about why you're running away. And when you say why your God is chasing you out the land, why you're running away from your God, why these God, your God is doing these things, he says, then they will know that I am Jehovah. Um, they will know what kind of God I am, a God who demands righteousness and holiness and justice. Um, and interestingly, of course, the people who run away are the people who, rather than turn and face God, they're the ones who are saying, I want to keep going the way I'm going. Um, I'm just going to try and do it somewhere else. Um, elsewhere, Ezekiel speaks about false prophets and false prophecies. He talks about those who say, peace, peace. Um, in other words, they're saying, don't worry about any of these things that these prophets are saying. Don't worry. It's not really the word of God. God won't cast us aside. He won't, he won't punish us. He will never destroy Jerusalem. We are his covenant people. Um, there's nothing to worry about. And, and God calls them out and says that, you know, they will be destroyed and their prophecies will come to nothing. Um, and, it's, and, you know, the word to Israel is when you see this happening, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. He also talks about the false prophets in terms of um, what he calls untempered mortar. That's a, a wall that is, is built using mortar that is not properly mixed. And so you build the wall and you, you, you make it and you, you plaster it with this mortar and then you whitewash it. So it all looks absolutely fantastic. And then the slightest trouble comes along and just falls and collapses. And, and the Lord says, when you see the prophets, the false prophets of Israel, their prophecies coming to nothing, then you will know that I am Jehovah. When you see everything, all the falsehoods, all the lies being destroyed, then you'll know that I am Jehovah. Just lastly, out of the things I've picked, um, he also talks about the broken covenant. He, talk, he speaks about Israel as being um, like a, um, an unfaithful uh, wife who, um, who is unfaithful to her husband. And God is pictured as the husband and Israel as the wife. And he says that, you know, you, you've been unfaithful with all the nations around you. You've looked to these other gods, these other nations to give you to give you protection he speaks um in places about um about egypt and the false hope that they gave to israel um and he speaks of the nation of israel like someone who not only is not isn't seduced into um you know, a, a wrong relationship isn't seduced into these things but actually actively goes out looking how to betray um their husband actually actually looks at, actively looks goes out looking how to betray the Lord, um, and he says, "When you see these things being destroyed, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. I am jealous for my people. I will not be shared." Um, and you know, all these people, all all these sort of um, these kings who've led them astray, and all the people who sort of eagerly went after them, um, they will know that he is Jehovah. And so in the midst of all that, and it's a pretty grim um, tale, most of it, um, but as with almost with all the Old Testament prophets, I think, uh, almost all of them, if not all of them, um, in the midst of all this sort of dire 
um, dire warnings and dreadful uh, consequences of, of what they've done, there are these incredible promises um, where God and God speaks to 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 Ezekiel and says, "Say to the people," he says, he says, um, make, makes promises and says, "When when you see this, that, or the other, then you will know that I am Jehovah." So it's not just in the punishments that they are to know Him, but that in the in the promises. Ezekiel chapter 11 starts, talks about the restoration of Israel. Um, he talks about how there being a new heart, a new spirit, the stony heart being removed and the heart of flesh being put in. In Ezekiel chapter 16, he, he talks about um, a new covenant being established. Um, in chapter 34, he talks about um, the good shepherd um, and says, you know, when, when you see this shepherd, when you when your souls are cared for, when you see this, this great shepherd who will come and care for you and deliver you and look after you, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. And in Ezekiel 36 um, also talks about um, a new heart and new, a new spirit, but also um, speaks about the people of Israel being gathered back in from the nations into this new thing that God is going to do. And he says, then when you see the people coming back to me, when you see the nation people from the nations being gathered in, the Jews being gathered in, the Gentiles being gathered in, then you will know that I am Jehovah. Now the most famous chapter uh, story in Ezekiel, I think is probably the story of the dry bones where Ezekiel is told to prophesy to this valley of dry bones and they all kind of stand up and there's a great army. Um, but really what God is saying is when you see the, the dead come back to life, when you see um, people restored, when you see new life happening, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. Then you will know that I am the God who brought you out of Israel, out of, out of Egypt. I am the God who took you through the Red Sea. I, I am the same God who, who delivered you from the, the threats of the kings. I am on the, on the way up to Cain. I am the one who delivered all the cities into your hands. I am the one who established the, the, the judges and the prophets. I am the one who established the mighty King David and Solomon. I am the one who established the kingdom. I am the one who loved you and gave you this land. I am the one who kept you and sustained you. The God that you've forgotten. When I have done all these things, then you will know that I am Jehovah. I am your God. Um, there's, there's, there's so much more, and you could go into the depths and details of Ezekiel so much more. And I, in my, even in my studies, I've only really touched on it, but I've kind of drawn this theme out. Um, but the thing is, the question is, I suppose, then what next? What, what happens after Ezekiel's prophecies? This is where I very briefly touch on chapters 40 to 48. At the end of chapter 39, when we're kind of at the end of all these prophecies and, and, and the, the latter chapters, the sort of mid to late 30s chapters have got a lot of these promises in. Um, there's no attempt to start again. There's no promise that, um, you know, there's going to be a, uh, going back and starting again and new kings and the rest of it. What, what the sense I get from the, what God prophesies through Ezekiel is um, there's no attempt to start again. There's no resolution, no, no sort of no, no new kingdom resolution, as it were, no New Year's resolution to try harder. There's no urging from God to try harder. He says we need something new here. We need a new thing. Um, the people need a new heart. Um, you know, there, there needs to be this this new creation, this new temple, this new priesthood. Um, there needs to be a new covenant. Um, and obviously Ezekiel is given this vision of, of how some of these things will come into pass. And Ezekiel's contemporary Jeremiah, he agrees. It's, it's from Jeremiah that we, we get this idea, particularly of, of the new covenant. Um, and so God says, we need something new. Something new has to happen. And as I thought about all this, and I thought, well, Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me through all this? What I, I've got, you know, this, this, I've got notes of hundreds of verses and so much, and I'm trying to get my mind around it and trying to understand it and praying about it and and just asking the Lord, give me a way to, way to sort of cut through all these things, these these ways. The Lord is saying, then you shall know that I am Jehovah. Um, and I'm thinking about all these 
these sort of dreadful punishments and there's all, these, all these gruesome verses in, in, in his Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other prophets. And, and in my heart, so a few things. And the first is this. Everything that Jerem, uh, Ezekiel saw poured out on, on Judah and all the things that happened to Israel. These are no longer things I need to worry about. These are things that are no longer really concern me. Because all the wrath of God was poured out on Christ on the cross. So everything where God, as you know, all the things that happened were the outworking of that covenant. The, the God, you know, he made them promises and, and they made him promises and he clearly laid out the terms. Um, you can see that in, in Deuteronomy and the other um, from um, those books. Um, and God's word to my heart was, all this is done. All this is over for you. All this is over. For those who are in Christ, all of this is over. It's done. It's finished. There is nothing left in your life, in your experience, or any, any, you know, what, if you go and read through Ezekiel, if you, if you find yourself identified in Ezekiel, whether it's in the, you know, if it's in the idolatry or the sort of, def, if you feel that you've defiled your sanctuary or, you know, you've, you've fled from God when he wanted you to behave one way and, and you, you wanted to go your own way. If, if you've listened to false prophets and, and um, lies and things that have taken you away from God, if you feel you've broken the covenant, all the punishment for all of that was laid on Jesus Christ at Calvary. It's done. It's finished. And God has made a new covenant, a new basis of working with us. And every time God made a new covenant, whether it was Abraham, he knew me as God Almighty, whether it was through Moses, he, he, now you'll know me as Jehovah. There's a new name. The name encapsulates all the works that have been done in that name and that you are a part of. And the name that God has given us <clears throat> is Jesus. The name that is far above every other name. The, the, where, where Paul says in Philippians that all he wants to do is to know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul was a Jew. He, he, he had heard of Jehovah, but now he knew a new name, a new power. And that kind of led me to a, another question. I will finish with this. It might sound like a very strange question um, to a group of people who are, who are Christians. Um, but it's this, who do you know God as? I've mentioned three names. Now, the interesting thing about these three names is that each one encompasses all the promises of the previous one and all the good things. Um, nothing is lost. So when you go from Abraham to Moses, nothing is lost. Only things are gained. And when you go from Jehovah to Jesus, nothing is lost. You only gain. But if you think about Abraham, he had promises that were never fulfilled. He, he, he knew God. He, he heard the promises that God gave, but they were never fulfilled in his experience. The people of Israel, um, they had a covenant, a covenant that was burdensome and heavy. They had this law that weighed them down, that condemned them, that, that could not give them life. There was constantly on them the fear of God's wrath. There was constantly the possibility that they, in their minds, that they had transgressed God's law, that they can transgressed his ways, and that now there was going to be punishment. And of course, to the repentance, that the repentant, there was deliverance. But there's this constant aspect of, you know, every year, this reminder that I'm a sinner and there's a price to pay. There's, I'm a sinner and there's a price to pay. And in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, amongst all these prophecies, prophecies there's all these promises that god makes 
prophecy, promises to the Gentiles, promises to Israel, promises of the new heart and the new creation and, the, and being given the Holy Spirit. But again, promises that are never fulfilled. Promises that are waiting for some future event. And then we come to Jesus. And we have this written, all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. All the, all the wrath is taken away. All the reasons for fear are taken away. Now God does, he does teach us and train us and rebuke us. But the fear of his wrath should, should for those who know, know Jesus should be totally gone from our lives. Now the Lord wants us to know him and know him better. He wants us to, he wants to expunge everything from our experience and our lives that, um, that um, is contrary to him. But we have a new heart. We have a new spirit. Abraham didn't have the promises. He looked forward to a day when he, where his, his descendants would. He never got it. When, people, when the people knew God as Jehovah, they had this burdensome law. And we, in Jesus, have all the promises. No fear for the future. We, should, we do not fear the coming of God again, because we know that all the wrath that ought to be poured out on us has been poured out on him. And this isn't a, a theological question. It isn't a question of do you know your theology and know who, who El Shaddai is and who Jehovah is and who Jesus is. But in your daily experience, in our daily experiences, who is the, what is the name of the God, as it were, that we walk with? Is it a God who, do, are, are we walking our lives thinking, yeah, there are promises, but I, I, I'll never see them. Um, they're for some time in the future. Are we living our lives in fear of, of tripping up? of getting it wrong, of being punished, of, of not making it? Or are we living our lives in the bold confidence of, of the people who, have, who can read the book of Ezekiel and all the things that God did to punish that nation? And they can, you can look at all those things and you can identify yourself in there and you can identify yourself with joy because you can say all of that has been done and has been worked out and fulfilled for me in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I, I, I give this exhortation, go and read the book of Ezekiel and ask the Lord as you read it to let make himself known to you in every nook and cranny of your lives and, and persuade you more fully that, that you are free from all of the of the punishments and you are the inheritor the the ex, you can experience all the promises it's not about whether we are we call ourselves a christian not what we believe or not it's 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 my daily living waking experience my every thought am i dogged by fears and worries or am i more and more constantly filled with boldness and confidence towards god because i'm in jesus christ I trust the Lord has spoken to you through what I said. I hope it made sense. And I pray, maybe at the beginning of this new year, that we shall all know him more fully. We will all know more fully the implications of what it is to be in Christ. So we're no longer living in any kind of lesser experience, but we all are living fully in Christ. The Lord bless you all. Amen.